uh, today. This is um, an upper, um, an arm mass deep in the muscle that in a, uh, like a 25 year old woman. And it grew quickly over a period of a month or two and was quite painful and tender and swollen. And so this is an incisional biopsy. It's a, 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 a pretty large piece that they took out of the lesion, but not, did not remove the entire lesion. So let's look at what we're dealing with here. From, from first, uh, even at low power, I think you recognize there's bone, right? We see bone everywhere. But this on uh, imaging study, it was actually in the soft tissue and not in the bone or attached to the bone. That's a really important question to ask anytime you think that you have um, something that is, it has bone in it or cartilage in it, you want to know, is it actually um, touching the bone or is it totally in the soft tissue, all right? So let's take a look at some of the areas here. We, it's a very busy lesion. There's a lot going on. So it, it's kind of, uh, uh, kind of overwhelming to look at. So we got to break it down a little bit. First, the outside here has got a nice like, layer of bone here that's all um, woven together. And it is, it is woven bone. You can see at higher power. There's uh, irregular little lines of, of um, cartilage, I'm sorry, of um, collagen there that are forming the osteoid. And you can see a, a very, you know, puffy, juicy, um, uh, large osteoblastic cells that are around the periphery of these little bone um, seams of osteoid and also embedded in the center of them. And they're very large and, and uh, they really stand out. It's very cellular around, the, uh, around all of the bone, okay? So that's what we're seeing at the edge lesion. And then also look at this stuff out here. We'll look at it over on the other side, it's better. Look at that, that's skeletal muscle with tons of edema, right? Each individual skeletal muscle fiber is kind of splayed apart by this edematous, loose background and kind of is becoming smaller and a little bit atrophic. So there's a lot of reactive change in edema in the skeletal muscle. Then there's this layer of very robust, um, brisk osteoblast proliferation with woven bone. And then as we get towards the middle here, um, the the bone is still there, but the cells don't look quite as big, right? There's still kind of some large osteocyte or osteoblast cells um, around lining the outside of the bone and in the middle of the osteoid, but they're not as big and as uh, juicy. Um, I like to use that word a lot. It means big and puffy uh, as these ones at the edge, right? So it kind of changes as you go from the outside to the inside of the lesion. There's also some scattered giant cells here. And remember, anytime that you've got some bone formation, um, bone formation or bone breakdown, you're going to get osteoclasts that are going to come and hang out and be there for the party, right? So that's, um, that's what's going on there. In the center, we've got this kind of cellular spindled area with some kind of loose edematous background. And then, wow, what in the world? Look at that crazy island of cartilage with huge nuclei. Uh, pretty scary looking, right? If you've not seen cartilage like this before um, and know the trick here, which I'll tell you in a minute, you're going to get really worried, okay? So um, when you see really bizarre, weird looking cartilage, the first things I think of are not chondrosarcoma. Number one, if it's in the bone in the right radiographic and clinical setting, I think of chondroblastic osteosarcoma where the cartilage can be pretty atypical. The other thing, and the thing I see more often is reactive cartilage. Reactive cartilage, like at a fracture site or repair of bone um, adjacent to another like lytic lesion that's caused a fracture, something like that, you can get really wild, bizarre looking chondroblasts or chondro, excuse me, chondrocytes, um, cartilage cells. And so this, even though these look really wild, uh, don't get uh, too worried about it yet, okay? We gotta put all the pieces together, but there's more of it here. There's a lot of weird looking cartilage, okay? Now, let's go uh, to the next slide here. Here's another area from the same, the same lesion. There were several different blocks. This one looks quite a bit different. We are, um, we are, you can see the skeletal muscle here with a lot of atrophy, the tiny little shrunken and splayed apart skeletal muscle fibers. Then this kind of loose heterogeneous spindle cell area with a lot of mixoid, loose mixoid change in the background, some little foci of kind of almost cystic mixoid change. And uh, here and there in the midst of this, you'll see a little bits of islands of that osteoblastic, rich, uh, large osteoblast concentrations forming some little um, foci of osteoid. And I think there's more of it up here. You can see again, the atrophic muscle, this loose mixoid spindled area, and then osteo, uh, osteoid production here, okay? So when we put all of this together, 
Um, the uh, one thing we would want to get ideally is some radiographic information and clinical, okay? So I, I usually try uh, to look at, this is true for derm, path, and bone and soft tissue. I try to look at the slides first, think of all the possibilities it might be, and then figure out the clinical and the radiographic to see if it matches up with what I think on pathology. So I figure that gives me the, the most open mind to approach a case uh, and, and kind of to avoid being biased. Um, although I always tell, you know, surgeons and, and treating physicians should never worry about not biasing us by, by depriving us of clinical information. That's wrong. Uh, but I do in voluntarily do that to myself. When I first look at a case, I find that I work best that way. And also sometimes I'm spectacularly wrong. I think it's something and then I look at the clinical and I'm like, there's no way this fits. But I learn something every time that happens and realize, oh, this thing can mimic that other entity. So there's just a general pearl for how to approach pathology, at least uh, in my way. And I, that's still how I do it in practice most of the time. All right. So when we, uh, when we approach this, um, this is a lesion. Actually, I'm going to skip past the next slide for one second. We'll come back to it. Here on the left is what this lesion looked like around the time of biopsy. You can see, even though it looks like it's connected to the bone, from an alternative view, you can see it's actually centered in the soft tissue. It's a ring of bone with a kind of lucid center, but a rim of uh, radio opaque bone, mineralized bone around the outside, like a shell, an egg shell of bone. And so when you have that in the middle of muscle, and then when you see on pathology, stuff that looks like loose myxoid, almost like nodular fasciitis with this loose myxoid cystic change and then atrophic muscle. And then you see a shell of reactive bone being laid down around the outside. That is perfect for myositis ossificans, okay? And that is what this is. This is like one of the most robust cases of myositis ossificans that I've seen. And if you are looking at this and thinking, I'm crazy, how could this possibly be a benign thing? You're not alone because the first time I saw a recut of this when I was uh, um, Dr. Weiss's fellow, I brought the slide to her and I was like, how is this not a sarcoma? Please teach me. And over the years, I've gotten a little bit more comfortable with it, but it still does look wild and scary sometimes, especially on a small biopsy, if you get the wrong area. The key to this is the clinical scenario, right? This rapid growth, and then the shell of bone around it on imaging. And microscopically, what we see it, uh, correlates with that, that appearance. The center of the lesion is composed of loose fasciitis-like um, uh, myofibroblasts. Sometimes they can be pretty big and weird looking. They can have those big ganglion-like cells that you see in proliferative fasciitis and proliferative myositis. They can have a lot of overlap. And then they have a, an organized zonal kind of layer of bone around the outside. And a, a lot of times you'll see this kind of reactive cartilage too that's, that's turning into the bone, right? It's starting as cartilage and then it's um, being uh, converted into bone over time, right? It's similar to what you see at like a fracture callus site. So because all of this looks so reactive, in the past we've always thought that these were reactive lesions just like nodular fasciitis and other fasciitis family entities. In more modern times, we've recognized that these probably represent transient self-limiting neoplasms, benign neoplasms, because just like nodular fasciitis, the majority of cases have gene fusions involving uh, MYH9 and US, uh, UPS6 uh, genes. So the, uh, the presence of, uh, of those genes um, can be really helpful, and it has been discovered that the same translocation is found in the majority of cases of myositis ossificans um, and a closely related entity to this that occurs on the finger, which is called fibroosseous pseudotumor of the digit. So it's good to know about that because it has all the features we're showing right here in this case, but it's on the finger. And it's important to know about these entities because if you're not aware of them, you can easily make the mistake of thinking that this is an osteosarcoma, right? Because you got atypical cartilage and these big, very large um, osteoblastic cells and their large cells getting embedded in the middle of the osteoid and it looks very scary, right? And of course, like, like nodular fasciitis and other fasciitis family of things, you can have a lot of mitotic activity, okay? So the key is seeing that that's this kind of zonal shell and that as you go to the middle, I think the next piece actually represented some of the middle of the lesion, you find that actually what you have there is the kind of loose fasciitis-like spindle cell proliferation. But again, I mean, these are big, weird looking myofibroblasts, right? That's what happens in some cases of fasciitis um, and other reactive settings. And, and reactive settings that have the fasciitis-like appearance can also have these large kind of almost ganglion-like, you know, like a little eyeball staring back at us. 
um, and those can look quite scary, okay? So um, in hard cases, you can send it for the USP6 uh, gene uh, uh, rearrangement study if you want. If it's positive, that's very supportive that this is a benign process in the fasciitis family. But if it's negative, it doesn't exclude uh, that possibility, all right? And um, that is a good example here. Now, what is really cool about this case, aside from the fact that we've got such a nice big piece of this to look at, is that we have follow-up, okay? So this was taken out and then they, once the diagnosis of uh, myositis ossificans was rendered, they decided to watch and wait and see what would happen if the lesion would shrink down because on scans, there was a lot of edema and swelling around the lesion. So they thought they would let it calm down and kind of resolve. And then whatever was left over afterwards would go and surgically remove it. So this is what it was like at biopsy. And it was finally excised about, fully excised about nine months um, after this biopsy. And here's what the excision looks like. Whoa, totally different. We still have this shell of bone. We still have a loose spindled area in the middle, but let's go take a closer look. The bone has now started to convert and organize and remodel into actual lamellar bone. See, there's lamellar bone lines, all that crazy busy woven bone that we saw at the beginning. Nine months later, it's starting to look almost like the bone of a normal, like, you know, one of our normal long bones. Pretty amazing, right? And you can see that around it, the soft tissue may still have a little bit of edema, but nothing like that massive edema and skeletal muscle atrophy that we saw in that other. There's still a little bit. The skeletal muscle is not totally back to normal, but it definitely does not look as irritated and as edematous and atrophic as it was in the other original specimen. And then in the middle here, most of what used to be that brisk spindled um, myofibroblast rich area has now turned into either loose kind of fatty tissue or in the middle it's kind of resolved down from what is basically like the, the fasciitis like areas I think of as being kind of akin to granulation tissue right there's a lot of overlap between granulation tissue and fasciitis and just as granulation tissue eventually kind of calms down and turns into a more collagenized less cellular scar in normal wound healing, you can see a similar process happening in fasciitis as it resolves. So this used to be that very cellular mitotically active area, and now it's calmed down into basically some loose collagenized scar tissue with some hemocytorin left over. So it's really cool, I think, to be able, I, I, this is the best example I've seen of this where we get to see the outcome of what happened later. And there's some cystic areas that are like, like kind of seroma almost filled with blood and serum. But this is what the final result was. And it's really cool to see how it goes from that very cellular scary looking lesion to this very obviously benign uh, lesion here, okay? So let me show you the radiographic images. So that one right here, this is um, an early uh, x-ray either, I can't remember if it was at or right after the time of biopsy, but you can see the ring of bone. Look what happens over time. I know it looks larger here. I think it's because I zoomed the, you can see how the, the, um, the, the humerus is wider here than here. It's because I zoomed in too much. So that's my fault. Um, radiology fail on my part. But you can see the mass now is a lot more uh, opaque. There's a lot more dense bone here. Here there was a lot of more immature osteoid and not as much mineral. Here it's very mineralized and turned into more mature bone. So you can see that happen over time. This was taken I think about uh, maybe six months after the original uh, diagnosis, a few months before it was finally taken out I think. Um, and then here was um, here are some uh, MRIs and you can see at the top, this was actually a couple months after the original biopsy. And so there is some post uh, procedural change here, but there's a ton, here's this like a loose edematous area in the middle, the little shell of bone you can vaguely see around here, but there's tons of edema in the background, uh, skeletal muscle. And then look what happens six months later or so when they scanned it uh, preoperatively, you can see that the edema has all calmed down. It's kind of shrunken down and started to resolve. So really cool to have this like uh, this uh, uh, ability to correlate between what it looked like originally and what it looked like as it matured over time. And here's just another view um, showing kind of the contrast of what we started with. I guess this could be like a nice meme online, like how it started and how it's going. So uh, it's a nice case to remember. And if you, haven't, if you haven't had a chance to study this slide yet, I encourage you to go on the Path Presenter and pull this up and look around carefully at this slide because the more you study scary looking reactive things and scary looking fasciitis like things, 
the more prepared you'll be to deal with those in real life when you get a challenging biopsy and you're trying to decide is this cancer or not because it's a very, very difficult uh, dilemma sometimes. And I've even in practice, I have one of the mistakes I made early in my career after doing a fellowship is I called something a sarcoma and it ended up being a proliferative fasciitis. It's a very robust example and I debated, but in the end I thought it was malignant and, um, and more expert people than me saw it and said, no, we just think it's fasciitis. And uh, no one got hurt and I learned a great lesson from that, that even no matter how much training you have, it can still be really challenging to deal with fasciitis-like things and reactive things versus neoplasia. And one of the things Dr. Weiss told me in fellowship was that that was one of the main goals of the fellowship was to be able to sort out reactive and fasciitis family of things from neoplasia because it can be really challenging. So, so go study that and learn the features and see just how wild benign stuff uh, in the myofibroblastic category can look. Oh, another picture. I See, I, I really like this case. I couldn't get enough of it.